Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us live on Facebook for the second event in Cornwall Council's biggest ever listening campaign, The Cornwall We Want. I'm Sarah Yeoman, News Editor at Pirate FM and I'll be your host for the evening. I'm joined by Cornwall Council Cabinet Member and Portfolio Holder for the Environment, Edwina Hannaford and guests from charities, businesses and campaign groups. As a reminder, you can ask questions or post your thoughts in the comments section as we go and I'll do my best to read as many of them out as I can. There's only one topic on our agenda tonight. We're here to talk about the environment, how we can protect it, how we can tackle climate change change and how we can grow the green economy here in Cornwall. We want to hear your ideas, your opinions, your hopes and fears so we can start a conversation. As with our first event, this isn't a debate. There are no sides, there are no right or wrong questions or answers. We're not here to talk about council tax or bin collections, important as those things are. Our focus tonight is on the environment we want. So now I'd like to introduce Councillor Edwina Hannaford. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome to everyone uh, to Cornwall Council's The Environment We Want discussion. Uh, it's clear to us that climate emergency and caring for our environment is extremely important to all of us. I'm just going to give a quick update on some of the things that Cornwall Council have achieved since declaring climate emergency in January 19. I think we've achieved quite a lot, but there's still a lot to do. So we've, uh, to tackle Cornwall's existing older housing, we have secured £8 million to retrofit over 700 homes with energy efficient measures and solar power. The Vent and Teague Smart Grid Wind Turbine is constructed and will begin generating energy next month. We have a bus subsidies pilot underway, providing more affordable public transport for all. Cormac are using biomethane uh, run van and hot box as a pilot for renewable biofuels. £500,000 of uh, community infrastructure levy money uh, has been aligned to climate change projects and the first phase of the Saints Way has been completed. The forest for Cornwall first trees are in the ground, not, not more to do of course, and we are using a decision making wheel in all the decisions of the council. We launched recently the Carbon Neutral Cornwall Hive, uh, an online platform to share experiences and information. And we set up a sector specialist partnership forum for, for working together in the main emitting sectors. The first localism climate change workshop has been held with more planned very shortly. And we've been involved in a schools eco conference held with more planned for next year. So we are also developing other innovative projects to support our response to the climate emergency and they include the climate emergency development plan document which will set climate change planning policy, developing an electric vehicle infrastructure uh, network and we've ordered our first wave of, of electric fleet vehicles and I'm taking delivery of an electric bike uh, to trial next week. Uh, we've developed carbon accounting practices and carbon literacy training for all of our 6,000 staff. And we have been involved in an interreg schools project. The local nature recovery pilot, one of only five, sets out the strategy for how we will bring back nature to Cornwall. And through the local uh, enterprise partnership, the local industrial strategy has aligned policies uh, to be green, clean and inclusive growth and we've match funded geothermal trials at United Downs and uh, Eden Project. We know that working in partnership is essential if we have any hope of reaching our ambitious target of Cornwall becoming carbon neutral by 2030. To this end I have a couple of exciting announcements to make so I'm delighted to announce that we are working with Crowdfunder to make over £200,000 available through three funds, the Low Carbon Projects, Town and Parish Councils and Community Groups Action Planning, the Forest for Cornwall, and you'll be able to learn more about our first Carbon Neutral Cornwall Hive event in September. We'll be sharing details of that event shortly. As we continue our recovery and renewal from COVID-19 pandemic, 
We have committed to placing climate change at the heart of everything that we do. We may be gaining ground on the COVID-19 emergency, although that become clearer. We know that the climate emergency, it never went away. It's with us now. And we will prioritise within our recovery and renewal uh, all things that will impact on future generations. So it's good to see some young people here with us tonight. Which is why we've recently pledged to accelerate delivery of our climate change action plan. And we are joined this evening by a panel of experts in their own fields of conservation, farming, renewable energy, as well as representatives from the community action groups across Cornwall. So I'm really excited to hear about what you are doing and how we can work together to make a real difference to cl tackle climate change and make the environment we want for Cornwall for future generations. It's really clear to me Cornwall Council can't do this on our own. Um, this is something that we have to do collectively, one and all for Cornwall. Thank you. And I'll hand back to Sarah. Lovely. Thank you, Edwina. Um, so now we're going to go to our first video of the evening where we'll hear from Hugo Tagholm from Surface Against Sewage about how we can protect our marine environment and Carolyn Cabman, who's here with us tonight, about some of the work Cornwall Wildlife Trust is currently involved in. Hi, I'm Hugo Tagholm, the Chief Executive of the National Marine Conservation and Campaigning Charity Surface Against Sewage. And we're very proud to lead our campaigns from Cornwall, um, campaigns on some of the biggest issues affecting our ocean and environment today. We have four key pillars of action on the plastic pollution crisis, on the ongoing water quality issues in our rivers and in our ocean, um, on the loss of biodiversity through the call to restore big parts of our ocean and terrestrial habitats um, with rewilding projects, and then of course the overarching um, issue of ocean and climate crisis, um, which is impacting not just Cornwall, but our ocean around the world and countries around the world. Um, there's never been a more important time to engage the public, to mobilise the public in the call to restore our oceans and protect our beaches. Um, this is the decade of ocean science and habitat restoration. And we need to call on our leaders, our political leaders and business leaders to do much, much more at much faster pace to truly protect and restore our ocean, our beaches and our wider environment. And that's something we're going to be committed to from the beachfront right through to the front benches of Parliament, um, where we help organise the Ocean Conservation All-Party Parliamentary Group, where we can call for policy and legislation change that will protect Cornwall, the UK and the ocean around the world. I'm Carolyn Cadman from Cornwall Wildlife Trust. Nature has an amazing ability to trap carbon safely and nature-based solutions can help to tackle the challenges we face. Cornish hedges absorb pollutants, improve air quality and slow the flow of water across roads and land. Tree planting or wetland habitat creation near the source of a river can also slow the flow of water and reduce the threat of flooding downstream. Nature-based solutions like these can also benefit businesses, tourism, agriculture and improved health and wellbeing benefits for residents and visitors alike. Last Friday I attended the release of Sigourney into a fenced area in a wooded valley in Bodmin. Beavers used to be native in Cornwall and by building dams and digging water channels during heavy rainfall, the land can hold more water, which doesn't flow as quickly into rivers, reducing the risk of floods. Slower water means cleaner water as there's more time for soil and pollutants to settle and more wetland habitat to provide space for other wildlife to thrive. Find out more, cornwallwildlifetrust.org.uk OK, so a question for our panel. Other than its people, the natural environment is probably Cornwall's most valuable asset. How can we do more to protect it? And if people could introduce themselves to us before they start speaking, that would be great. Yes, I can see Manda, you've got your hand up there. I can't hear you there. Okay, Edward. Uh, I haven't actually, but I'm really happy. I think we're having a couple of sound issues. Um, let me see who's got their hand up. Edward, did, did you want to say something? Edward, we can't hear. Okay, Shelley, I'm going to go to you. Can you hear us? 
hopefully can you hear me yes sounding great right. cool um yeah uh, uh it was great to hear um the SAS and talking about um stuff against sewage and they've been going for so many years and um drawing attention to us and I think it would be really lovely if the council could start seeing you know Cornwall as it doesn't just end <laughs> you know with the land the sea is very much part of it and um I don't know like so I'm a teacher um and I'm working down in Penzance at the moment and students are really kind of fed up with just drawing pictures of look at the litter and round the neck of this turtle and putting posters up in classrooms that they already see they want to do something real um I think it would be amazing if we could have youth workers available um on our coast or in our parks and things like this enabling us to work and inter interface more with with um with nature with young people um I also think it'd be amazing thing to think about having boats um uh, we need to encourage our young people to be traveling um using using boat and sea um I've got a son who works very much in the um sailing industry and uh he said a lot of his mates who live in Cornwall um and live in Penzance feel like they go up country and then they come back and they feel like they're the end of the line and he said he feels like he's at the beginning of the world and I think that's a really important thing and um and if we can encourage our young people to use the sea as a mode of transport um to develop the skills um in those sorts of ways but also to protect the marine life and everything that's out there would be absolutely brilliant Cornwall wildlife fund have been a trust have been amazing um Nick Taylor who's one of the um wildlife volunteers volunteer coordinators rather um has been working closely with with Mounts Bay and recently did stuff with our um it, it for our detox festival and it's about making things very real. Um students are fed up, you know, we're past we're past the stage of I'm sorry we don't have a form for that. We need to be helping our young people do real things. I could got waffle on loads um but I'll shut up and let somebody else get in. <laughs> Carolyn, I know you've got your hand up. Do you want to jump in and could you in introduce yourself to us as well? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Carolyn Cadman, Chief Exec of Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and thanks for the the invitation along tonight. Um, yeah, building on what Shelley just said, um, we've had some real moments in Cornwall Wildlife Trust over the last three years with with a program that we've got called Your Shore Beach Rangers, where we're taking school children and young people through a program with Cornwall College and various other partners, I should say, um, through a program where we remove all the barriers to get them in the sea, we handhold them in, we take them on snorkel safaris and rock pool rambles and various ways in which just to get them wet and confident in the sea. And that we found that absolutely starts them on a journey from being, you know, interested in something like surfing because it's a bit cool, through to being really concerned about what's in the sea, the, the marine species that are in there. Um, and, and what we're trying to do at the moment with the various funding streams that are available is trying to learn as much as we possibly can from that marine um, youth experience and all the community groups that have sprung up around marine issues, uh, both um, hosted by ourselves, but also by Surface Against Sewage, and try and turn some of that energy onto the land as well. Um, because nature on land um, is, not, is not really seen as being as cool as marine nature and conservation issues so we want to kind of embrace what's good about marine conservation and, and sprinkle a bit of that magic on our terrestrial work um, so that's that's something we're hopeful of doing um, and we are really determined that to um, inspire as many young people as possible to and give them the tools give them the equipment give them the um, ideas and the skills to actually do something about the climate crisis and the ecological crisis because it's here it's real and they want to do something and, and we can support them in doing it. Of course. So we're going to take a couple of questions um, from Facebook. So we've got one from Nicola Tomkinson, who says, we seem to be building everywhere, taking away our beautiful fields and homes for animals. What do people think about that? I'm happy to speak if no one else is. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, 
Well, just a little statistic, and I don't, I don't want to go on about statistics, but over 40% of nature is in, of species are under threat in the UK, and, and Cornwall reflects that trend. There's a few drivers that are, that are pushing that decline. One is climate change, uh, one is intensive agriculture, another is intensive fishing, um, but a big one is also development, where habitat space is being lost. Um, so I'm not happy with a a build, build, build agenda with no um, regulation in place. Um, but I'm interested in reading the planning reforms that have come out today and seeing seeing what the future holds. Of course. And um, Oliver, I think you wanted to jump in. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm Oliver Baines. I'm a um, farmer, um, member of the local Na nature partnership and also a member of Extinction Rebellion. And I think what we've heard here are some fabulous examples of local activities, but the, the questioner or the guy or person who just made that comment has pointed out this disjunct that takes place between the amazing work that people like the Wildlife Trust are doing and some really harmful activities that are taking place on a bigger scale. And it is part of it is about impact of housing on the environment but it's also the impact of new roads we've got the new a30 being built uh, which in spite of you know whatever compensation is provided will encourage further transport further cars we've got people buying larger greedier cars so while this amazing stuff is happening we've got a much bigger issue which is looming over us which is that carbon emissions in Cornwall are not coming down and you know, it's that we need to be reducing our emissions by 13% every single year. And there's no sign yet that we're anywhere close to achieving that target. Okay, and um, another question is, how do we balance new homes which are necessary and protecting natural habitats? Yeah. What do people think about that? Edwina, I think you want to jump in. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, the, the questioner is um, quite right. People still need homes. But I think we have to be really, really careful about who we're building homes for and the quality of the homes that we're building. So I, although we've uh, got that investment of uh, eight million quid into uh, retrofitting homes, we have to make sure that the homes that we build for the future don't need to be retrofitted. And I think we have to build with nature. I know that Cornwall Wildlife Trust have got a benchmarking um, programme that they're working on and working with Cornwall Council. So for me, it's about right homes in the right place for the right people, but it's also about the quality um, of, those, uh, of those homes. Um, as far as the commuting uh, and usage of cars, you're quite right, it has been going up. But interestingly, through the pandemic, it, it did come down uh, um, significantly. So just in Cornwall Council, um, we saved or stopped doing 42,000 commuting miles a day. I mean, that's astounding. I haven't used my car for five months. Um, so what we need to do um, is to make sure that we get the momentum of the different ways of working, whether that's um, more working from home or working in perhaps local hubs rather than I, you know, I've worn a group up the A30 over the years, so I don't want to go back to that. So I think we need to take this um, learning from what's happened over the last five months and make sure that we um, capitalise on that. Um, and so we don't need to build new roads, that we are more localised in our, our in our approach to a whole range of things, really. Of course. And um, Rob, I think you wanted to jump in and say something. Yeah, hi, uh, Rob Halliday. I'm a um, tenant farmer from South East Cornwall, um, and I'm also an FU Deputy Chairman. Um, Edwina, just interested in what you were saying there um, with regards to, to localism and housing. How much of an effect is um, this week's announcements from central government uh, on planning? How much control do you think you're going to lose locally, and how much direction can we actually have influence over ourselves going forwards? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, I'm really worried about it. And I think Caroline's uh, build, build, build um, is incredibly worrying. Um, I can only speak on behalf of my own town council. Um, I'm on the planning committee there. 
and we've written to all the other um, town and parish councils in South East Cornwall saying we need to work together to say actually we're losing that local control and that local flavour. Yes, there is a, a delivery issue, but I go back to my previous comment, right houses, right place and for the right people. Um, so I'm not happy about that at all. Um, I'm really concerned as a chair of the neighbor, local neighbourhood um, plan. We've been working on that for several years. I mean, it's all our work and all those um, opinions and needs of local people are just going to be walked over. Um, I'm sorry, it's de the centralised model doesn't work and certainly doesn't work for Cornwall. Um, so I'm really worried about it, Rob. So Pan Par Town and Parish Councils are rising up, so I hope others will too. Thanks, Edwina. So we're going to move on to our second video of the night, um, this time from our panellist, Oliver Baines, on agriculture and the green economy. Hello, my name is Oliver Baines. I'm a member of the Local Nature Partnership. I'm a farmer and I'm also a member of Extinction Rebellion. I have strong views on the environment, um, particularly with farming, where I think we can make a major contribution. First of all, through improving soil health, which means dramatically reducing our use of sprays and fertilizers, expanding organic farming. Uh, I think we need to look at uh, expanding horticulture and reducing livestock numbers. Um, and I think uh, issues around open canopy woodling, woodland and agroforestry need serious attention. There's also a big public dimension to this, which is about better design for public access to the countryside so that people can have better access. I also think allotments on the edges of towns and villages, community-supported community agriculture schemes, and uh, lots of issues around food supply, localising food supply. Thank you. OK, so some interesting suggestions there from Oliver. Agriculture is obviously a huge part of Cornwall's economy and will play a major role in helping us tackle the climate crisis. Rob, as an NFU representative, who would you like to um, would you like to respond to some of the points that Oliver made? Yeah, I would. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I thoroughly agree that, you know, agriculture is a huge player in the county and, and we're, we're you know, representative of controlling a large sector of the land. And therefore, you know, we have a responsibility to, to ourselves, who obviously are at the, at the very much the forefront of climate change. We probably feel it more than anybody else, the effect on, you know, our lives as yours, but also um, from the point of view of the effect it has on our business. The only things I, I would sort of counter, I think we have to be very careful uh, about going uh, wholly and solely down an organic route. Um, we have to be a little bit careful that we have um, a society that needs to be fed at all different price points. And we need to be a little bit careful that if we if we ratchet ourselves up to such a level, uh, the only way those people are going to be fed is if we import their food from places that we don't have control. Um, and I do have concerns over particularly an American deal. Um, we're getting some very, very thinly veiled um, assurances from government, I feel, um, on, on the food that's going to be imported. Um, and we need equivalence of standards. That's really, really important. We have world beating standards in the UK. There's always room for improvement. Um, but I think that we need to recognise what we've got. The climate we have is, you know, fantastically good for agriculture. Um, and if anything, looking at climate change um, on a world basis, you know, we look to be doing considerably better than numerous other places. Um, so I think we need to enhance the environment to support our farming where we can, but not lose sight of the fact that we need a profitable agricultural sector to be able to invest in environmental goods. And Christine, you've got your hand up. Was there something you wanted to say about that? Yeah, so um, evening everyone. Uh, my name's Chris Koenig. I uh, am the Technical Director at Weybridge Renewable Energy Network. We're a small community energy organisation um, in North Cornwall. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the uh, the, the, the good um, symbiotic relationship that you can have between renewable energy and agriculture. We've, we've seen already across the county um, with regards to solar farms um, and, and some wind farms where 
uh, the, the farmers are still able to, to graze sheep um, and, and in certain areas to grow certain um, crops underneath it. And in fact, I've, I've seen reports with regards to um, uh, sheep being particularly <laughs> uh, liking the shade that is casted by uh, solar arrays. Um, so I think there's there are ways in which um, uh, agriculture and renewable energy can go forward um, hand in hand and, and sort of produce a, a double uh, a double outcome and also in in other areas um, there's also opportunity to increase biodiversity um, where it's not necessarily on agricultural land. Thanks Christine. So I'm going to take a question from Facebook. So this is from Victoria Harrison. She says how about wildflower nature verges as you come into towns? So Botherham saved money with eight miles of wildlife verges. We also need to be growing more fees. How about more allotment space or help for people to grow at home? What do people think about that one? Ed Wiener, I think your hand is raised. Oh, yeah, just, um, um, I just wanted to highlight, I think it's a really good point, um, that we've been looking at the way in Cornwall Council we cut our verges. Um, it was only a few years ago that we used to be getting complaints. Um, you haven't cut that verge, that hedge is um, overgrown. Um, people wanted it to be manicured and looked like it was cut back and therefore loved. Actually, I've, I've got the opposite view to that. And so we've launched um, with Highways and our Environment Service a sort of when to mow and when to grow. So we've actually cut back the number of times uh, that we do cut those verges. But we're doing that through negotiation with um, our towns and our communities. So we'll be talking to town and parish councils um, and asking them, you know, do you read, does that, that, that path really need cutting? They'll say, yeah, um, all the mums and dads go, go to school that way. And if it's overgrown, they can't get the prams through. But actually over there would be fantastic to do a bit of um, pollinating sowing. So I think it's about a, a balance and it's through negotiation with communities. Um, but I think we should be doing a lot more of that. Um, so we've completely changed our verge maintenance policy um, to reflect uh, and that and to encourage wildflowers. Even done it out, out at County Hall as well. Uh, some fantastic, not that I've seen them for five months, but um, we are trying to uh, strike that balance. And Dawn, I think you wanted to say something on this as well. Yes, hello everyone. My name's Dawn and I'm from uh, crowdfunder.co.uk and we're based in Newquay in Cornwall. Um, and I just wanted to build on Edwina's opening remarks where she said that um, there's over £200,000 worth of funding on Crowdfund Cornwall at the moment. Um, and by that, what I was thinking about, if, if communities wanted to come together and develop uh, shared spaces where they can encourage nature to to come through and break through they can do that through crowdfunding money to raise the funds they need to make that happen and we've got three new funds coming onto crowdfunder the town and uh, council parish fund the carbon neutral fund and we've got a, a sort of raft of other funds where people have used um, this funding to you know look after their environment and bring the community together around uh, things that they really care about in Cornwall so lots of people are doing it and it's definitely something I would suggest people look at if they feel passionate about something environmental that they want to change in their area. And Edward I can see you've raised your hand did you want to say something about it as well? Oh Edward we can't hear you not sure if your microphone is muted. Not sure. We'll have to come back to you. OK, we'll go on to a, another question from Facebook. So this is from Rebecca Ryder. She says, how can we work together to reduce the use of pesticides in gardens, parks, roads and pavements? I'm sure Oliver's got something to say on that. Oliver, jump in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, this is a, a, a really kind of vexing subject because um, 
there is such debate about the use of the use of sprays, um, whatever type of pesticides we're talking about, and there are many different classes, and they have many different effects, and especially um, cocktails of different groups of chemicals can do enormous damage. And we know how degraded our soils have become in agriculture, in large parts of agriculture, uh, not all of it, obviously, and there's some soils in Cornwall which are very rich, luckily. Um, but the use of them, if we if we want to reduce the use of sprays within, let's say, uh, on verges or within villages and the hamlets, I think in political terms, the only way it's likely to happen is where people see that there's a connection to human health or damage to human health through the use of sprays. Um, in farming, of course, it's rather different because, because as organic farmers, we think that the damage that sprays do are largely to um, the microbiota in soil, so that the so, soil health is so, so important for farming. Um, and for capturing carbon through soil organic matter, soil carbon. Um, but it's a slightly different subject in, in terms of when looking at ways of reducing the use of sprays. I think it's rather different in agriculture and in the community. But you know, we have to get a grip on this because the damage it's done to the ecology is just enormous. And Carolyn, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we, we um, Common Wildlife Trust benefits from funding from Southwest Water to work with landowners and farmers to to help help give them advice about how to manage their their farms around certain water drinking water catchments across Cornwall. And um, we found that once we've developed a relationship with the farmer and convinced the farmer that we're not going to be um, that we, that we're out, we're there to help them as well as to help wildlife and water quality. Um, they're much more likely to work with us and to do things like soil testing and to take a take a, a, a what, what's the word a leap of faith but informed by the science that they can actually reduce or in some case remove the the, the um, nutrients or pesticides that they're putting on their land that their their parents and their grandparents who also farmed the land also used to do and they can start breaking those habits. Um, with confidence that their productivity and their profitability doesn't go down. And I think that's 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 kind of key. It's building knowledge and awareness, skills and trust back into back into the farming system and not being the medical equivalent is relying on a tablet to make you feel better. Um, whereas now we're realising that nature has benefits to, for your well-being. Well, in farming, um, we need farmers to, to realise that nature has benefits for farming as well. Um, and to make that and to normalise that in farming practice, which, does, which to be fair, Cornwall is, is, is getting much, much better and is pretty good at that. And Christine, was there something you wanted to say on that one as well? Yeah, I was just going to sort of talk about consumer choice, really. Um, obviously, Oliver has mentioned um, organic gardening and, and, and within his, his vlog, he talked about uh, community supported agriculture. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Weybridge to have um, our own uh, community supported agriculture, the Camel CSA, that, that run a, uh, a two organic principles um, veggie box scheme. And not only does uh, it provide a fantastic um, day out for the family if anyone wants to get involved and uh, bring themselves in touch with nature a little bit more and, and you know understand where their food comes from, but it also produces um, the lowest carbon um, food that that can be bought um, in the local area, and uh, and and it's full of nutrients and and no pesticides at all. So um, I just uh, like to say that other other communities, and I'm sure there are other communities across Cornwall that have got similar arrangements. But it's it's up to us as consumers of food to uh, to make the right choices as well. Edwina, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, thank you very much for that. So um, Cornwall Council have very much taken a lead on the banning of um, certain pesticides, glyphosphates and neonicotinoids. So we um, have, through a motion that I brought to Council in 2016, um, we banned the use of them uh, for weed control, uh, our weed control. Um, Part of that was also a pollinators uh, action plan, and you can find details of that um, 
on the Grow Nature Toolkit page on the Cornwall Council website. There's lots of really um, good tips in there and you can actually read the Pollinators Action Plan. But I do agree with Oliver, there is a difference between community and farming. Um, sometimes they're necessary, um, but um, um, I would prefer they weren't because I do firmly believe that there is a link between the use of those and on human health. Um, so I'd like to think that um, others that are responsible for control of weeds and verges, some, especially our town and parish councils, might take a lead from Cornwall Council and adopt the Pollinators Action Plan. Um, I think we've still got a little way to go with some of our contractors. Um, I do hear, a, a, I, I witnessed somebody using it uh, on our land down at Penzance. And I stopped him. I said, why are you using that? You're not supposed to. So I think that means all of us have a bit of a responsibility. Now you know that fact. If you see somebody using glyphosate on our land, I want to know about it. Thank you. So you're going to take a question from Facebook. And this is from Sean Stratton. He says that we need to become food secure. That means protecting farmlands and not importing as much food from around the world. What do people think about that? I, who's got their hand raised? Um, Carolyn, was there something you wanted to say on that? Sorry, I'm just being very slack and I've forgotten to lower my, my hand. So perhaps someone else, give a chance to someone else to speak. <laughs> no problem at all. Who have we got? Rob, did you want to jump in on that one? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we talk about and this is this is the story that's always told of, you know, what happens if we see U-boats in the channel again? Well, that, that's realistically, that's not the threat of our time. The the, high, the hypothetical U-boat in the channel is actually climate change. Um, and we really do have to be very, very careful that we don't export our, our food production to other countries um, from the point of view of not only food security, but also having control of what we produce. Um, and it's quite interesting just sort of harking back to the last conversation a little bit and that there is a massive movement um, in, in farming and particularly, I, I think, in Cornwall, where we have a lot of pasture based agriculture, um, you know, regenerative agriculture, looking at how we can use livestock to improve soils is a real that's a real buzzword at the moment. And people are very keen to learn that farmers are not switched off the ideas at all. Um, I think we have to be a little bit careful of not following rhetoric, um, particularly on things like herbicide and pesticide use. Um, absolutely, we we need to look from a business point of view as much as anything else. Farmers don't want to be spending money on these costs if they're not effective. Um, but also, you know, from the point of view of the environment, we have to be careful what we use. But just taking the example of glyphosate in agriculture, which is very different to your parks and gardens example, the use of low rates of glyphosate may actually mean that we don't have to plough soils to get rid of weed burden, and therefore we're actually helping to retain carbon in the soil and we're also not disturbing soil on you know what can be some quite steep hills in Cornwall um, and having the erosion effect that goes with it but all this comes it's a circular conversation it all comes back to the fact that if we can keep our food production local then we we can over time control and finesse these matters to come up with the best result for us and our, our environment can I jump Oliver. in yeah. oh, Sarah, sorry. Can you for me? Oliver what, what are your thoughts about that well, I, I think Rob makes some important points, actually. Uh, the, um, um, I don't think there's I don't think there's a good case to be made for the removal of all sprays. Let's leave it at that. I mean, we need to look at drastically reducing their use, but it'd be very, very hard to sustain farming if you remove them altogether from everywhere. Um, uh, if only because some intensive production is probably still required in for in order to feed our people. We've got to remember that so much of our food is imported at the moment. I, I think one of the really important points is to look at shortening our supply chains. And if we can grow everything we possibly can within Cornwall that we need within Cornwall, that's a real bonus for us. Um, we have to, I mean, from Cornwall, we have to export, of course, because we have such a large livestock sector. So we would have to export. But we can shift into across to horticulture, but only, only we can only do any of these things without central government support. We need the incentives because otherwise people will simply go bust. So we have to have a, a framework of support for farmers, which allows them to make the transition. And if we 
can do that, then we can achieve our um, our goals. Amanda, were you trying to say something before? Did you want to jump in? I was. Just, I'm not sure if my sound's working. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Brilliant. OK, just a quick point, really. Um, this is where the sort of systems thinking comes in and it goes back to what we were saying previously about housing. If we build houses where people haven't got access to green spaces or allotments or gardens, we will continue the complete disconnect between ourselves and the outside world. We still refer to nature as something other than us, whereas, of course, we're just as much part of nature as your nearest caterpillar or cow, really. Um, and if we thought about it in terms of cohabiting, we just tend to behave quite badly <laughs> in that space as one of the species. So if we think about it as cohabiting, we understand that growing our food and understanding the benefit of that in our natural environment is connected also to the sorts of houses that we've got. And we found a way also to take individual responsibility. So we can't blame farmers for growing stuff that is shipped outside Cornwall if we don't buy it from them down here. So it's trying to find ways in which we don't build lots of supermarkets working with our local planning um, uh, structures, but also try as far as possible. If you've got anywhere local that is selling local fruit and veg, buy the local fruit and veg. Not everybody can do that. If you can, we should absolutely be doing that. That makes it more available to local people. So it's about the most big structural issues like housing and making sure we get the right sort of housing in the right place for the right people with the right sort of access to green space so people can grow. Uh, and it's about taking individual action understanding that we are cohabiting in a space and taking responsibility for doing the thing that we can at individual and family level to support these bigger ideas. Can I come Thanks. in on that, Shelley? I'd, I'd just like yes, to say that, um, that I think the whole way in which we connect with everybody is really important. Um, and uh, how everybody talks to each other. It was great what Caroline was saying, how when she talks to, you know, the farmers and actually people, you know, we need to stop demonizing each other and actually looking at what everybody's got on offer you know we've got amazing um wonderful people down here the artists we haven't talked about all the artists that are down here at the moment that can do, do things but one of the main things i think in relation to um what you were just saying is how we view waste and i almost want to get rid of the word waste and call it byproduct um there's so many things that we look at um, to help people grow and develop things. Um, but we're just um, throwing so much away in terms of calling it waste. I recently set up in the school um, an, an allotment and kids started growing and they loved it, absolutely love it, getting their hands in the soil. But when we got some of the council, which was lovely, thank you to the council, we, you donated us a load of compost. But it, because it had, had to go through all these safety measures, it was dead as a dodo and I had to enrich it with good, honest shit from my horses. Um, and I think every horse it produces at least like 300 pounds of poo a year. Do you know what I mean? The dung beetles they attract feed the soil. We need to really look at, really looking at how we, how the whole social structure is created and how we need to recognize that there needs to be a cycle that goes on, eliminate the word waste, introduce a network where people can advertise the byproduct that they have and then somebody else might want it. Thank you Shelley. Um, so we're now going to move on to our final video of the evening and we'll hear from the Weybridge Renewable Energy Network about their community's hopes for a greener and cleaner future. I'd like to see more electric car charges in Cornwall. I would like to see more community tree planting in Cornwall. I'd like to see more rooftop solar panels. I'd like to see farmers in Cornwall supported to restore soil carbon. I'd like to see more biodiversity in green spaces in Cornwall. I'd like to see more people commuting by bike. I'd like to see lots more big wind farms in Cornwall. I'd like to grow up with more sustainability in the curriculum in Cornwall. Okay, so as we know, Cornwall's the perfect place to generate wave, wind and solar power. Christine, um, as part of the Weybridge Renewable Energy Network, what more do you think can be done to promote the use of green energy in our communities? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think promotion, it, even though it, it feels like it's an established technology now, I mean, it's it's long gone through its uh, its early uh, early days of, of people being sceptical about whether these things work. Um, but it's still a case of communicating and, and, and getting people to understand that they have choices around where they, they buy their energy from and how they get their energy. Uh, so at the moment, um, REN are looking at um, an energy equality project. So what we're keen to do is to make sure that everyone has access, access to low carbon renewable energy. Uh, if they don't have a roof, if they don't have uh, the, the funds themselves to to install it, that that shouldn't be a barrier. And there's absolutely no reason uh, why everyone can't um, benefit from, from low carbon uh, renewable energy. And at the moment, um, a, a lot of the, the solar farms and some of the wind turbines uh, that are actually installed um, within Cornwall don't belong to the local community. They don't belong to anyone who lives within Cornwall. And so that is essentially exporting the value of that um, straight out of the county. So we're really keen to see more local ownership of renewable energy. And we're working hard and, and, and we'll be approaching the Cornwall Council to, to look at their buildings and whether or not they would be willing for our community to invest in solar on their rooftops. Um, uh, to help balance out our local energy requirements and in the same uh, in the same way cutting carbon and helping to alleviate fuel poverty. Thank you and um, Tian I know you had your hand raised would you like to share your views on this? Um, can you hear me all right? Yes we can w would you like to introduce yourself to us as well? Yes um, I'm Tian and I am one of the organisers of the youth strikes in Truro. Um, and I just wanted to mention something that was said a while ago, but um, it was about how we can buy local fruit and veg and local food and that sort of thing from farmers and from, and yeah, from local places. But I just think there's a really important point to be made there about accessibility and about um, how not everybody can do that and not, um, and as important as like individual change like that as, you know, buying, local food like within like for families and things a lot of people I mean it can be more expensive and it can be even harder to find and you have to go out of your way than on your like weekly shop and things like that so I just think that's a really important point to be made because too often in conversations about climate change and how we can you know how we can change things there is we leave out points about how not everybody can access it and things like that so when we talk about change we have to make sure that it's about system change and about um i don't know for example schools um import we're well, not importing but um buying local fruit and veg and doing it through places like schools and places that um can get more money to be able to do that if you understand what i'm saying rather than putting the focus on individuals and individual families to do that because I think that can be hard for quite a lot of people and yeah. And Edwina, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I just wanted to comment on what Tian just said. I think it's a really, really important that she's point that she's made. Um, I think one of the features of um, the pandemic has been people have come alive to the importance of local supply chains, to local networks, whether that's through support and certainly through the local um, food um, food chains. So I think that um, local is good um, because it's not only good for the climate because it's saving food miles, um, but it's also good for the environment and it's good for society because it's fresher. Um, but we do have to be mindful that not everybody has uh, access to that. Um, as far as um, renewables, um, the development plan document, the climate emergency document I spoke about in my introduction, we hope to zone areas, so for renewable energy, because uh, not everywhere is great for renewables. Um, we're also investing in um, uh, floating offshore wind uh, as well. So I think Cornwall has the potential, uh, forget about the northern powerhouse, I think we've got the Cornish powerhouse, I think that we've got the raw materials and the resources to be um, net exporters uh, of renewable energy. 
Um, the problem is, is that our grid network is not really set up for sending energy to the rest of the country. It's very much set up for bringing it down to us. So this is one of our asks of government that we need some significant investment into our grid infrastructure to really make sure that we can um, capitalise it. That uh, wind turbine at Venton Teague was the first wind turbine in Cornwall, erected in Cornwall since 2016. Um, it's those grid connections and also the economics of, of it, um, removing subsidies. So we, we somebody spoke about rhetoric uh, earlier on, but we need um, government help on this. We can't do this on our own. That's massive investment. So if government is really serious about a green recovery, uh, then they need to invest in that uh, infrastructure. Um, we also have a little revolving fund as well. So if there are some local schemes uh, for renewables, um, you can hook into that as well. I think it's about three million pounds in that pot. So it's for all of us. The whole system has to be geared to what you have to want to do it, I think, whether that's us, the community and government. And Rob, do you want to share your thoughts as well? Yeah, I mean, Tian, I absolutely echo what you say. Um, and, and it comes back to my, my thoughts on price point. Um, that we do have to make sure that we do produce food that everybody can afford. Um, and again, if we cut our supply chains as energy inevitably becomes more expensive in the future, um, you know, that localism agenda on making sure that everybody is fed and everybody is fed with good quality food. Um, and, and that comes from the point of view of, you know, that we now spend about 8% of our um, disposable income on food as opposed to about 40% after the Second World War. So. You know, we do we do have good affordable food in this country and we need to be able to make sure we can keep that without getting to a point where we're importing food from abroad whereby somewhere the tab's being picked up you know there's, there's no such thing as cheap food we need good value food and if we're buying cheap food there's every likelihood it's the environment somewhere that's picking it up and you know particularly the likes of the us where they use huge amounts of um, antibiotics not just for preventing um illness in livestock but actually just as a as a growth promoter it's a practice that's banned in this country and i think we really need to recognize the good standards we have enhance them protect them and make sure that you know local food is available for local people at the right price thanks rob um it's going to take a question from facebook so this is from katie kirk um her teenage daughters say to her we all agree we need to make radical changes and fast but how when we get careers advice, it's from random businesses that aren't necessarily good for the environment. Talks from environmental students and businesses, please. I can jump in on that if I can be can I, if I can be yes, here. Yes, of course. Go ahead. I'll switch my camera off because I think my sound is a bit better. Um, uh, I think all of this is connected. And just going back to the food issue, we won't be able to sell local food more local people unless we have a planning system that allows for that local provision and not just supermarkets um, but it goes back to the same point that has just been made by Katie's daughter if we only bring in the big boys and show that's the way the future is we will only have a future that looks like the way the big boys are describing it. Cornwall's got an extraordinary history of really small inventive creative edgy courageous bloody minded businesses and social enterprises and organizations and sole traders and individuals who do things in a different way. So I think if we looked better at what we already have in Cornwall and how we do things rather than trying to do things that we think other people are doing, like big shiny Tonka toys elsewhere, then that is exactly the sort of skills that we can be giving to our young people. They will need to be resilient and edgy and inventive and know how to collaborate with others and know how to do things by themselves and know how to challenge the status quo. So if we looked more to what the sort of activity that's going on already, such as the School for Social Entre Entrepreneurs and all the and the, the CSA, Community Supported Agriculture Project, there are so many different examples, uh, creatives and uh, people in the arts and, and cultural sector that could engage with our students to say, this is what we do. You don't need to sell your soul to one of the big multinationals who we're probably going to bring in to build more supermarkets and housing estates. So it's encouraging our young people to think quite differently about what their future might be and thinking small, actually small and inventive and collaborative rather than big and 20th century. And Carolyn, can we go to you next, please? Yeah, I just wanted to echo what Manda said, really. Um, 
we we find in Cornwall Wildlife Trust when I when I um when I meet with my other colleagues across the country, um, I'm really pleased to say that Cornwall is streaks ahead of other parts of the country. We've got a really proactive um, local authority and a unitary local authority. We've got a load of businesses who place the environment and uh, are really keen to enhance the place they live and the place they work in. And they are here for a lifestyle as much as anything else. And we've got communities who all bump into each other at the school gates, whether they're part of farming, industry, charities, public sector, and we all know each other. Um, and I think the fact that we're, there's, there's these strong connections in Cornwall means that um, we, we put the, the, the needs of the place strongly at the, the front and centre of our decision making, and that includes the environment. And it makes my job, to be honest, it makes my job a bit easier than my colleagues across the country. But I mustn't, I'm not going to be complacent because nature has been in decline since the 1940s and it will continue to do so unless we take action and I'm hopeful that the young people on the call today are going to be part of that action going forward. And Dawn I can see you've got your hand up did you want to jump in and say something? Hi um no I just I just agree with um everyone who's been sp speaking already and I think um you know what we're seeing is young people sort of leading the charge to to a large extent, which is really, really positive and exciting. Um, and certainly on Crowdfunder, um, we see lots of projects coming forward where people are taking action, they are getting involved. And, and in crowdfunding is really strong in Cornwall. Um, we're one of the most dynamic crowdfunding communities in, in the UK. Um, and a lot of the projects we see are do have an environmental twist or bent and a lot of them involve young people so I think there's a lot to be positive about um, and it's really really exciting going forward. Thank Can you. I just come on, yes, on to that and just say, Shelley, go ahead. Like I do feel like very empowered by the way in which the council has said it's a climate crisis. When we're in school I felt very empowered by that to be able to know that we've got the backing of our council um, and students feel that and they welcome that. So that's really good. And like, yeah, you, um, like Manda was saying, we've got these amazing creatives here, um, you know, from Carter Cove. Um, what a wonderful touring package that is, getting things right out into our communities. Um, we've got everything from Sturts up in, you know, um, the north of Cornwall down to the Minac um, right at the very tip you know, offering all different sorts of arts and telling stories in different ways and, and encouraging young people to, to look at things in new light, um, the amazing dance and stuff that's going on. And if the council can see that the artists are can, can be a really useful tool in this whole communication and the connection, I think that will be a really valuable um, point to make. And a big thank you. This council allowed me to build a straw bale house and it was the first domesticated building um, of straw bale 20 years ago and um, I'm still living in it and um, thank you Cornwall Council. <laughs> and um, Christine was there something you wanted to add? Yeah I was just going to say a lot of the the community organisations are run by volunteers um, and there's absolutely no reason why volunteers can't be young people as well so if there's a if there's a whole generation of enthusiastic climate change activists please take the time um, not only to, uh, to to carry on doing what you're doing but to volunteer and, and support the other community groups that are also trying to to, to battle uh, climate change in their own way. And um, Oliver, was there anything you wanted to, to say on this at all? Well, I'd actually put my hand down again because I, I think most of it is said. I mean, I, I think this is a fabulous part of this discussion um, because I'm, my own feeling is that we, and I know other people share this, that we shouldn't be relying on the structures and institutions and corporations that have brought us to this place to be the same ones to get us out of this place. I think we can make an exception in, in terms of Cornwall Council because it's our own council, our own democratically elected council. So we can excuse, yeah, we can we can leave that one aside. But I think that we have so much in Cornwall, and uh, you know, so much. What what Shelley's just said is brilliant because because our inventiveness in Cornwall is born of having to look after ourselves, and we know, you know, our communities 
look after themselves. It's not the same as it was 50 years ago, but it could be the same very quickly again, because, and we've seen this through COVID. And it's the, the idea that somehow we always need to rely on somebody else. Well, that, let's leave that aside and let's just rely on the, the bonds that we have with each other to be able to get us out of this mess. Thank you. And um, Rob, was there anything you wanted to add? Sorry, I'm afraid I've just uh, had a, a, an internet outage due to the wonderful way that central government funds our rural connectivity. So I've missed the last couple of minutes. I know I shall, um, I shall keep quiet and uh, let you carry on. No problem at all. Um, well, that probably is all we've got time for this evening anyway. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, remember, you can continue the conversation online on the Cornwall We Want website. And there's a link to that in the Facebook comments. Mm -hmm.